Hello, brains. Welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen, and today I'm joined by a very special guest, author and YouTuber Jessica McCabe. So, Jessica, it's great to meet you. Thanks for doing this today. Nice to meet you, too. And hello, brains. <laughs> If you're not familiar with Jessica's work, she's the creator of the YouTube channel How to ADHD, which is over one and a half million subscribers, which is totally incredible. And she's also the new author of the wonderful book How to ADHD, An Insider's Guide to Working with Your Brain, Not Against It. Uh, her stuff is fantastic. Uh, my partner, Elizabeth, is a therapist who was diagnosed with ADHD later in life, actually. And your stuff is one of the first that we went to when she received her diagnosis, and it was super helpful for us. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, that's what I kind of hope that, um, that, that I can help onboard people to, to this diagnosis because when I started the channel, I did not understand anything about my ADHD. I knew that I had trouble getting distracted. Um, and there was this medication that could help me focus, but that was it. I had a lot of misconceptions about it and stuff. And so everything I learned personally about ADHD, I put on the channel. And so I think for a lot of people, it's a good place to start, especially if you start at the earlier videos, you can kind of learn along with me. So you were, I think, 12 when you got diagnosed, right? Yeah, I was actually diagnosed for 20 years before I had any idea what that diagnosis meant. I was diagnosed at 12. I was told that I had trouble focusing. I was given Ritalin and that was it. You know, ADHD solved. Um, I did better in school and that really was all anybody was concerned about. So, you know, I continued to struggle with life for another 20 years. Um, you know, I had trouble planning and prioritizing and sustaining effort toward long-term goals. And I got into so many car accidents that um, that the car, that the insurance company threatened to, um, told my dad that they were going to have to uninsure all of us. Oh my God. You know, I had uh, eating, like disordered eating stuff. I was really impulsive with relationships. I, I mean, I, there were just so many things that I struggled with that I didn't know had anything to do with my ADHD um, for 20 years. For 20 years, I was going to a doctor every month or every three months, depending on the doctor and how many prescriptions they were willing to write um, between visits. And nobody explained my ADHD to me or went, you know what, like, how's your life working? Because they, they asked me if the meds were working. I was like, oh, yeah, they helped me focus. You know, any side effects? No. Uh, well, nobody asked me if my life was working because I'd have been like, oh, no, no, no. Like there are so many, so many unpaid parking tickets in my glove box right now that I'm afraid to look at and my credit's terrible and, you know, I can't keep a job. Like I would have explained a lot more if anybody had asked me the right question. Yeah. So you, you just said a bunch of things there that I think that if people are unfamiliar with ADHD, they might not realize have an association with the diagnosis. You said for starters, disordered eating, uh, issues inside of your relationships. Um, I, I forget the exact word that you used when you were talking about relationships, like being chaotic in your relationships. Or yeah, there are times like I remember in high school sitting next to a boy in in um, a con in a in assembly or something like that, and I was bored and I just impulsively <laughs> grabbed the guy's hand next to me. Like I didn't think about do I actually want this person to be my boyfriend. I just knew I was bored and I did something impulsive. And so now I had this boyfriend. Like there were so many examples like that that were just very ADHD in retrospect, but I didn't know that. One of the questions that Elizabeth was really curious about uh, going into this, that's, you know, my partner who has ADHD, is how you actually were able to sustain the motivation and like be consistent enough to write a book like this. It was so hard. I will be honest, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. I have never completed a long-term project before. And when people mm. point out, well, but you, you know, this channel you've been doing for six years, I was like, not on purpose. Like I didn't set out to, you know, spend six years doing a YouTube channel. I set out to put a video on the internet that would take a week to do. And then I did another one that took a week to do. And then I did another one. They were all actually a lot of short-term projects that just ended up being a career <laughs> in the long run. But writing a book, that's one project. That was one project that lasted, you know, it, more than a year. It was supposed to last a year. It lasted more than a year. Um, but it was so hard to to do, but I knew it was going to be hard to do because I'd never accomplished something like that before. And so I put a lot of supports in place. You know, like, first of all, I planned, I worked backwards. So I went, okay, if I'm going to turn in a draft of the book, like if, I, if I'm going to turn in a manuscript here, then I'm going to need time to edit it. And then I'm also going to need time to write each chapter. So let me block that time in. I'm also going to need some like weeks off so that I don't die because I knew that I would pour everything that I had into this. It was a really exciting opportunity and very important. So I scheduled four weeks off during the year to like kind of recover and recharge. So I didn't completely burn out. Um, and I worked all the way backward until I got to the, you know, the day that it was then and I was like, I need to have started already. So I, you know, that kind of kicked me into gear writing the book. 
And then I put accountability in place. I told my editor what my process was like and that I needed that kind of support. And so I said, the weeks where I'm supposed to be writing, can we meet? Can we meet? Can I show you what I've got? And we can talk through it. I'm going to hand you a mess. Like I'm going to hand you a hot mess um, those weeks. It's not. It's maybe not going to make any sense to anybody but me, but I need somebody to look at it because if I don't have somebody who's going to look at it, who's going to care if I'm not on track, um, I might not do it. I might be like, oh, it's, you know, I've got a year to write a book. Like that's a really long time. So I put accountability in place. I worked backwards when planning it. Um, I used most of the strategies in the book, definitely all of the ones in the motivation <laughs> chapter yeah, to get this yeah. done. Um, the nice thing was like, I had already had this basis of understanding of how my brain worked and where I might struggle, where I might run into challenges. And I had a, a toolbox of strategies already. And then as I was writing the book, I would, I would actually go back and reread certain sections to like inspire me to keep going. So mm -hmm. it, that helped a lot. I, I will say. Um, and I also got support. Like I had a research consultant that helped with um, you know, he did all the citations and he was able to talk things through with me. He was able to read things and do reality checks like, hey, am I explaining this well? Because I, I'm a science communicator. I try to simplify these really complex scientific concepts, but I want to do it in a way that that doesn't create like a misunderstanding of what is actually happening, like what we actually know from the research. And so let me make sure that I'm translating this correctly. So I when I when I ran into struggles with organizing my chapters and and chapter one, like my, my plan immediately fell off track, right? Like I gave myself two weeks to write the first chapter. Yeah. I, two weeks in, I was like, I, okay, first of all, I had to use the first week to figure out how I even want to structure this book. I didn't think about that. I didn't, I didn't think that like thinking about how to structure the book overall would be a part of it. I was like, I'll just start writing. Um, so I immediately was off track. Um, and then I was having a really hard time with the first chapter because it didn't fit into the structure that I wanted for the rest of the book. So I went to, um, a writing buddy that I used for, um, to help me with my TEDx talk and to help me with future talks after that. And I was like, uh, can you help me write a book? <laughs> and so she and I spent like three hours on the phone talking through the structure. And I think that that was key. Um, not only putting all these strategies in place, but also putting supports in place so that I didn't have to do it on my own. And that, I had to swallow my pride about that. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you about that was one of the, one of the really common issues for people who have ADHD or any kind of a condition more broadly that that feels is stigmatized, feels like a point of difference, and can lead to additional um, emotional awareness and therefore additional emotional sensitivity. Like there must have been times where that was pretty difficult. It was difficult. And, and there's a lot of internalized ableism in it too. Like I should be able to do this on my own. Yeah, totally. Right? Like I, I've I've written episodes for the channel. I've written talks and stuff like, never mind that like I had, to I had help with some of the talks too, but I, I really wanted to prove to myself that I could do it, that I could write a book and I wanted to do it on my own. And it, it took some swallowing of that pride and some humility to say, you know what, what's more important to me doing it on my own or accomplishing what it is that I'm trying to accomplish with this book. And I had to choose. Um, and I think that for a lot of people with ADHD, it's, it's a tough choice, but you do have to choose. Like, do I want to do this on my own or do I want it to be done? <laughs> do I want it to be what I want it to be? Um, and and I, I kind of want to normalize, like I, I talk openly about it. There's a lot of authors that use um, writing support that have a writing assistant or a writing buddy or even a full-on ghostwriter that writes it for them that don't talk about it. But then what happens is people, especially people with ADHD, see that and they're like, well, they could do it. Why can't I? And so I wanted to talk really openly about the fact that I did need this support. Even with all the strategies that I had, even with the experience that I have writing my episodes, I needed extra support. And that's okay. Was there a, a, a self-critical aspect that kind of came in that you had to work with? Oh my God, all the time, yeah. Yeah, and, <laughs> and like, were there particular things that you did or, or just like strategies that you've developed more broadly to help yourself? When that happens and you got to apply a little self-compassion to it? The best strategy I got actually from my research consultant, who's also a clinician, um, Dr. Patrick LeCount. Um, and it's it's a pretty common CBT technique. Um, he talks about coach A versus coach B. And I tell this story at the end of the motivation chapter. Um, and it's one that I went back to <laughs> a few times. Uh, but it's this idea that, um, like, imagine a little girl who's playing soccer and she's like eight years old playing soccer, she's the goalie, and it comes down to the end of the game, and it, it's down to, 
to her and this person who's about to kick the ball and can she save this ball? And she guesses which way the ball is going to go and dives in that direction to block it, but she guessed wrong. And the ball goes in the complete, complete different direction, flies right into the net, and she lost her team the game. Coach A um, brings, <laughs> brings her over and says, come here, come here. Like, what's wrong with you? We went over this in practice. You knew what to do. Like, you should have paid attention to this. And like, you know, if, if you'd, if you'd been paying attention or practicing, like you were supposed to, like, he just starts berating her and she feels terrible, right? She lost her team, the game and like feels awful. You know, he beat her up. She's beating herself up the next time that it comes time to go, you know, go to practice or maybe even a game. Maybe she has a tummy ache and she doesn't feel like going. She doesn't want to show up. Well, now imagine the same scenario, but now um it's the same thing she she misses the ball dives in the wrong direction but now coach b is coaching and he calls her over and says well okay like if you want remember if you want to know which way the ball is going to go pay attention to their eyes look look which way their eyes are looking and look at their foot which way is their foot pointing you got it cool you got it yeah we got this you know now you have something to try next time and he, he talks about um, how he says this to patients. And he's like, if you wanted your kid to have fun, like which coach would you want? And most parents would be like, well, obviously coach B. Like I would want the, the one who's just going to be, you know, supportive and encouraging and like give her something else to try. And so most people would, would choose coach B. And he goes, but what if you wanted her to go pro? What if you really wanted her to be good at soccer and you wanted her to go pro? But still most people choose coach B because there's not really a whole lot of benefit to just being yelled at about totally. what you did wrong. But most of us with ADHD, like we have this internal, these internalized messages. And when we mess up, that those voices start echoing in our head, like, what's wrong with you? You should have started sooner. Like, you know better. Like, you should have X, Y, Z. And I had that for a lot of writing the book. I had that pop up of like, oh, what's wrong with you? You should have started sooner. You know better. Like, all these voices echoed in my head. And so what Patrick teaches his clients to do and what I did for myself as well is ask yourself, what would Coach B say? Well, you know, Coach B would have said you've never written a book before and you had an idea of how, how long this might take you to do, but now you can adjust based on how long it's actually taking instead of how long you thought it would take. And, you know, you can reach out and you can get help. And um, it's just a much more gentle, more productive coach that I think we can all tap into in a really simple way by asking yourself, like, what would Coach B say? I think it's really telling that you picked three words on the inside kind of book flap to describe the book and they're honest, friendly, and shame free. And that third one I think is really interesting. You could have chosen all the words of the word world and you went with shame free as one of the things you wanted to highlight, which I think kind of just speaks to what you're saying here, the the primacy of those experiences, the ways that they can get into us and and how easy it can be for people to obviously have those experiences out in the world. But then to start generating those experiences internally due to that internalized ableism that you were talking about earlier. Yeah, eventually we don't even need other people to say these things to us because we're saying them to ourselves. I almost want to go back to that 12-year-old version of you and like kind of reflect on it a little bit because that's a that's a long journey that I'm sure you've been on with those issues, which are are so primary for people. And I'm wondering what that um, how that's changed over time for you. When I was 12, again, I, I knew I had trouble focusing. I needed these meds to help me focus, but that was really it. And so I didn't feel very empowered personally because there was still so much of life that was a lot of struggle for me. And I didn't know why. And I had these messages as to why, like th- what society looks at, like, well, you know, you have so much potential. You just need to try harder uh, or you're you're just being lazy or um, or I felt stupid or I felt like I had. I had all these labels in my head of like why I struggled with these things. I had all these negative judgments and stuff. Um, learning and, and those judgments stayed with me basically until mm. I started learning about my ADHD. Um, I was kicking myself in much the same way at 32 as I, as I was at 12 years old. Like, what's wrong with you? You know, like you're, you're so dumb. Like all these really ableist terms that I had internalized um, were kind of on repeat. They were on loop. Um, when I started learning about ADHD, what happened was I learned new terms for what I was struggling with. I learned that I wasn't stupid or, um, or flaky or ditzy or whatever. I learned that I had working memory challenges and that language helped shift my internal dialogue. So now when I run into a situation where I 
can't remember the instructions on the box I just threw away, or I can't remember somebody's name that they just told me, um, or I can't remember like what I was just talking about, much less what the other person was just talking about. Instead of beating myself up over it, I go, oh, okay, this is a working memory issue. What can I do? Can I offload something from my working memory? Is something distracting me right now that I can get out of my brain so that I can give this person my full attention? Um, I have much more productive self-talk and I, I also have stopped trying to be a different version of myself. I've kind of accepted that this is who I am. This is how I am. These are my specs. This is how my brain works and work with that instead of trying to force myself to fit a mold that I am never going to fit. I'm curious about the self-advocacy aspect of it here, because a bunch of the suggestions, you give all of these tools in the book, which are great. And by the way, as you might expect, uh, the book is extremely ADHD friendly and its structure and its content and the way it's presented. One of the things that you do is you consistently highlight particular tools that people can use or, or um, apply in their life in different ways that might help them out. And m- several of those tools, not all of them, but several of them are things like accommodate yourself, which can include like advocating for yourself in different ways, uh, saying no to different things, taking breaks generally accepting that you have needs and being clear about them, (laughs) like both to yourself and to other people. Now, I got to tell you, I am stone neurotypical and I know a lot of other stone neurotypical people. And admitting that you have needs, even as a totally neurotypical person, is really hard. Like that's a real challenge for people. And um, in order to get to a place where you can be like, hey, there's this thing that would be helpful for me. It often takes like a lot of internal work for people to get there. And I'm wondering what's what's helped you with that and what your process with that was like. First of all, having it validated that these are needs was really yeah. helpful. Um, I think I needed to understand ADHD well enough that I could explain and advocate for myself. I could say, oh, hey, my re- my working memory is a relative area of weakness. So you know, it would, it would be helpful for me if, or, you know, I work better if, um, but I needed to have that foundational understanding. And honestly, I needed it validated. Like, I love that researchers measure this stuff and you can point to it and say, yeah, research shows, you know, X, Y, Z, or like Dr. Barkley talks a lot about how impairing ADHD can be. And some people don't love his work because of that. And he's very medical model, but like, to me, it's the most empowering thing in the world because he does things like, uh, I in taking charge of ADHD, he has a, a page where he talks about um, a study that he did where people self-reported time management issues. 98% of people with ADHD self-reported time management issues compared with 8% of the neurotypical population. That's a huge difference. And so if I didn't have those numbers, if I didn't have those statistics, it would be a little bit harder for me because it's, it's not only the challenges of saying I have needs and they matter and I need them met. It's also the fact that our needs are weird right? And other people don't need those things. So we need to know why we need these things that other people might not need, or that it's imperative for us to have these things that other people might find helpful. But for us, it's disabling not to have them. There's a really, really big difference there, right? And so I talk about universal design and the how to change the world chapter being, you know, about things that are important for accessibility for people with ADHD also being helpful for other people. I'm wondering if there's a particular example that you have of something where accepting that you had a need around it um, really enabled you to do something about it practically or a way in which you've changed how you've worked with your brain over time around a specific issue. Yeah. Now for me, it's, it's a super casual thing. Like if I'm in the middle of conversation and I'm finding myself um, having trouble tracking what the person is talking about, I yeah. can quickly analyze like, is this that I'm I'm holding? Because I've worked limited working memory slots. Everybody does, but mine is more limited than most. It's it's definitely a relative area of weakness for me. So if I'm distracted by my own thoughts, like I I and trying to hold on to something to remember it for later, or because I want to say it to the other person, I'm not going to be able to really listen to what they're saying because my working memory slots are being taken up by what I'm thinking about. And so one of the things that I I will do is say like, hang on, I really, really want to hear what you have to say. It deserves my full brain. Let me get this out of my head so that I can give you that so I can give you my full attention. And it's just like for a super normal thing for me to do now or to say, hey, I'm filling out this form. Like, can you read me the numbers so that I don't have to, you know, so I don't have to hold them in my head and then like get over to the form, find the right place. And, you know, it's it seems like a simple task, but it's cognitively very demanding for me. 
And so I'll lighten the cognitive load by sharing that task with somebody else and saying, hey, you read this to me while I write it down, or I'll read this to you while you write it down. Um, there's a lot of people in my company. I think everybody is neurodivergent in my company just about. Um, and so we just normalize it. Like it's, yeah. it's just the same as saying like, Hey, I skinned my knee. Can I get a band aid? Like, it's just, it's something we do. It's something it, it's in the air. It's in the water. It's something we talk about openly and freely. Cool. I have this challenge. Like I need this support. Um, but before I learned about all that, what helped me was when somebody would ask and actually be genuinely curious. So when I waited tables, I was really good. I was a really good server after a while, after I stopped, you know, spilling drinks on people and forgetting to put orders in. Um, eventually, <laughs> eventually I got really used to where, you know, everything was in the system. And I, I was really good at taking care of people. I'm a people pleaser. I loved doing it. I'm very fast, very energetic. And so, um, and I talk very quickly so I can turn tables really quickly. Uh, there were a lot of things that made me a good server, but I have significant organizational challenges, which is also very common with ADHD. So I would fly through the restaurant and take care of all these people. And at the end of the night, um, it would, I would, I would, because I was such a good server, I'd be like one of two people who got to close. And so it would be me and one other person at the end of the night, um, sitting down to do all of our paperwork and they would inevitably finish way before me. And so then the manager who would really like to go home is sitting there waiting on me to finish my paperwork. And everything just looked like, it looks like, I don't know, something just exploded in my pocket. Like every, all the receipts are everywhere. Everything's all skewed. I don't know where the coupon is that I need to staple to this other thing. Um, and it's the end of the night. I'm off my meds. Like it's just, I'm exhausted. And, um, and I'm making myself like a pot of coffee to get through this because I know it's going to take me a while. Um, and so it looks like to the managers that I'm milking the clock. It looks like it's intentional that I'm trying to, you know, extend my hours as long as possible so that I can make more money. I wanted to go home too, but managers would just get annoyed at me, frustrated with me. They'd try to rush me. Hey, can you hurry up? None of that helped. What helped was I had a manager one day come and sit next to me and look at what I was doing and said, Hey, what's going on? And I looked at her and I immediately burst into tears because nobody had ever asked me. Nobody had ever asked me why I was struggling. They just made assumptions and judged me based on those assumptions um, or took action based on those assumptions. And so I, I explained to her, I was like, it's just, I'm really tired. I'm exhausted. It's the end of the night. Organizing is hard for me. And I, it, it just takes me a while. It takes me a while to find the right receipt to go with the right thing. And she looked at my absolute chaotic mess and went, well, would it help if you organized your paperwork throughout the night as you go? And I almost said yes, because obviously, right? Like obviously it would be easier if at the end of the night, my stuff was already organized. Yeah. That would make it faster. That would make it easier. And there's a lot of that with people with ADC. Like, well, would it, would it be faster if you had a to-do list to work off of? Sure, theoretically, right? The problem is um, actually doing that, right? Like yeah. actually putting together yeah. a to-do list and then not losing it and being able to prioritize. Like there's a lot of steps that go into having something that would be useful. So I looked at her and I could tell that she really was genuinely asking. It wasn't a, it, there's a clear right answer here, like, which is, should say yes. She actually wanted to know. And so I looked at her and I said, yeah, it would help, except my station is way at the front of the restaurant. All the staplers are way at the back of the restaurant. If I'm trying to fight through all of these tables asking me like, oh, hey, can you give me some catch up? And hey, you know, have you seen my server? And, and I'm trying to take care of all these people as I'm fighting my way to the back line to get to the staplers and then organize, you know, set shifting, right? Which is impaired in ADHD, trying to shift between cognitive tasks of somebody and bringing them catch up to let me organize paperwork, which is a challenge for me. I was like, I, that, I don't think I can. It would help, but I don't think I can. And she goes, well, what would help? And nobody had ever asked me that before. And I thought about it, like, you know what would help? Like if there were staplers at every station in the restaurant so that the one that I go to to put in my orders, usually the one that's closest to my station has a stapler too. So that if I have an extra couple of seconds, I can staple something really quickly. And she said, okay. So she got staplers for every station in the restaurant. That cut the amount of time I was doing paperwork at the end of the night in half. It saved the restaurant so much money. And it was not only helpful for me, but it ended up being helpful for the other servers in the restaurant too. So everybody was going to be more efficient at the end of the night. And all it took was somebody saying, what's going on? Would this help? What would? That's it. 
I mean, that's just like such a great summary of of so many issues out there, not just with ADHD, but with just like the world in general in terms of how we how we set it up, who we set it up for, who are we thinking about, or who are we considering uh, in different kinds of environments, who are we leaving out in different kinds of ways, and just like the sensitivity that you're speaking to. To be able to ask, um, to be able to not make the assumption that somebody is doing something because they're trying to be a pain in the ass or because they have some ulterior motive that's problematic. And instead they're doing it because like either there's a thing that they need that they're not receiving or there's something that would actually make their life much more helpful if they had it. And sometimes it just takes 90 seconds of unpacking an issue to figure out what that thing is in a really helpful way for everybody who's involved. Yeah. Rick Green of Totally ADD has a great, great line that stuck with me for years, which is everybody has their own right answers. They just haven't been asked the right questions. Is there something where, because now you've been doing the channel for seven years? It was seven years when I finished the book. It's eight years at this point. Eight years now, man. Okay. So you've been doing the channel for eight years. You've written this book. You must have received roughly a million emails from people being like, I've been diagnosed with this thing. What do I do now? Some version of that. Is there one thing that you find over and over again where when people learn about it or they're able to do it a little bit differently or whatever's kind of jogging your memory or making you think about right now just really makes a huge difference for them early on in this process in particular? I think being believed in their experience is is really huge because at the beginning, a lot of us are in a lot of self-doubt ourselves because we've been told by society that we are just lazy or just stupid or just flaky or just irresponsible or all of these things. It's really hard for a lot of people to believe that there actually is a condition, that this that their struggles are legitimate. And it can be a relief for a lot of people to get this diagnosis. But even with the diagnosis, there's still that in the back of your head, like, Am I just faking it? Like, what if the test is wrong? What if I don't actually have this? What if I am just lazy? Like, what if everybody, you know, all these messages I got growing up were right? And so I think being able to process the diagnosis and what it means and being accepted and being believed is one of the most powerful things. Um, Because what some people run into is like, you don't have ADHD. You don't look ADHD. You don't see me, you know, right? And then then you just immediately spiral back into that self-doubt and shame of like, maybe I tricked them, right? Like it's a kind of imposter syndrome. Um, it's, it's, this, it's so hard. I like, to me, it's, it's almost should be part of the diagnostic criteria. There are so many people who right before their diagnosis go, what if it's not ADHD? What if I'm just lazy? I'm like, well, good news. Um, <laughs> I hear that a lot from people right before they get diagnosed. Yeah. So <laughs> totally. I, I want to go back to what we were talking about at the very, very, very beginning, which was uh, you were naming these these things that you struggled with that might not fit a lot of people's picture of what ADHD looks like. And I'm wondering what do you think some of the most common misconceptions about the diagnosis are? Yeah, I actually outlined them in chapter two. Um, and I'm this is my favorite thing. I'm like, I already did this work. Let me just open to that chapter real quick. Um, <laughs> it's great. And this is a very common ADHD thing too. Like I had this epiphany and then I completely forgot about it. And then I have it again. And like we redo the same work over and over again. So I'm like, I already did this work. I can just read it to you. Um, first of all, like this idea that ADHD is an, is an attention deficit. It is not. It is not an attention deficit. It's a terrible name because it implies that it is an attention de- No, it doesn't imply. It states outright. This is an yeah. attention deficit disorder. It is not. It's about attention regulation. So this is such a, a huge misconception and it keeps people from getting diagnosed when they otherwise may be diagnosed because a parent will look at a child and be like, well, he doesn't have an attention deficit. He can play video games for 17 hours straight. You gotta be like, he clearly does not have this condition when it's actually coming from the same place. We have plenty of attention. What we have trouble with is directing that attention. So sometimes we're gonna get distracted by everything and we try to focus on something and it's like trying to nail jello to the wall. It's just impossible. And we keep getting distracted by things. And sometimes we're focused so intensely that we can't pull ourselves away. And that all comes from the same place, which is attention dysregulation, um, difficulty regulating our attention, not an attention deficit. Um, another one is you don't have to look hyperactive to have ADHD. There's a lot of people who are like, you don't see me ADHD because somebody's not bouncing off the walls or they don't fit into that stereotypical like boy getting into trouble stereotype. But that's not 
first of all, you don't have to have hyperactivity to have ADHD because there are three presentations. There's a primarily an attentive, primarily um, hyperactive impulsive, and then combined type, which means you qualify for both, which I do. Um, but also even people who have the hyperactive impulsive presentation, it doesn't always look like physical hyperactivity. It could be racing thoughts. It could be having a million tabs open and switching between them. It could be having a billion projects going at once or speaking really quickly with no spaces between your words. Um, there's a lot of ways that hyperactivity can show up that aren't necessarily as obvious to people. Um, and these are, you know, these misconceptions are exacerbated by stereotypes. You don't usually see somebody on, you know, on TV that has ADHD who's sitting quietly and daydreaming. But that happens too. <laughs> yeah. um, what else? The, another one. Oh, yeah, this is a really important one. ADHD is neurological. It's not behavioral. For a long time, it was categorized as a behavioral disorder. It is not. We now understand that the behavioral differences that we see in ADHD are due to neurological differences, neurodevelopmental differences in the brain. And so you can't punish away ADHD because it is not a behavioral issue. It is, it is a difference in how your brain works. And so the reason why people with ADHD do certain things is going to be different from the reason why someone who's neurotypical might do it. Um, if somebody's neurotypical is like fidgeting and looking down and stuff like that, they might, um, they might be bored. They might be distracting themselves with something else. For somebody with ADHD, they might be doing it to help them focus because they have, you know, their attention's bouncing all over the room. Picking up a fidget can actually help them pay attention to the person that they're talking to. So um, yeah, just know, knowing that there are neurological reasons behind the behaviors that we see in ADHD, that's a really important one to understand because otherwise it's really easy for people to assume, well, he just needs more discipline, right? You're watching a parent like with an out of control child and you're like, God, he just needs a, he just needs time out, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, mm, no, <laughs> um, no, <laughs> he needs, he needs probably support is more than anything. And so does that parent. Yeah, the emotional, um, the emotional aspect of it, I think, was the the aspect of it that was really helpful for me as the the partner of somebody who has ADHD. And I'm curious what you'd say about this if she were here. She would have loved to join, but she has clients today, so you know, the emotional regulation aspect of it was really helpful for Elizabeth to learn about. Uh, that the emotional sensitivity, the uh, deep empathy and sensitivity you can have toward other people. Uh, due to a profound ability to attune uh, in a way that I think a lot of people don't realize can kind of come with the soup of ADHD, just like extreme sensitivity toward very minor cues in other people. This gets a little bit to rejection sensitivity. And for me, just as a partner, as a, as a heart, as you like to refer to it sometimes, um, of somebody with ADHD, it was like really helpful to kind of get the realness of that and just the difficulty of it for people who have it and how big the emotions can be. Yeah, I wrote a whole chapter in the book called How to Feel because it is such a big thing for people with ADHD. And the emotional issues, um, the emotional dysregulation that comes with ADHD is something that we've known about as long as people have been talking about ADHD, but it got left out of the DSM. It got left out of yeah. the diagnostic criteria. So a lot of clinicians aren't aware of this. And so as a result, a lot of times um, we end up getting misdiagnosed um, with mood disorders when it's actually just the ADHD, it's emotional dysregulation from the ADHD. The difference is there's, you know, it's the top down versus bottom up. Like we are feeling the same emotions, the same intensity and the same strength of emotion as somebody without ADHD, but our brains don't then regulate that emotion. So that intensity stays. Um, we have a harder time redirecting our focus. We have a harder time, um, calming ourselves down. We have a harder time, um, you know, just, yeah, regulating, regulating our emotions. And that combined with a history of real and perceived rejection, it makes it really tough for us. And it, it makes it really painful because we are not able to regulate our emotions very well. And we have this history of being rejected by our peers, by our, you know, by our colleagues, by our teachers. Um, you know, we get way more corrections. Um, there was one study done that was like, I forget, the exact stats, but it, it was something like kids with ADHD receive on average 20,000 more corrections than their neurotypical peers do at the age of 12. And I think it was like five more a day. It's, it's a lot. We get a lot of negative messages. We get a lot of corrections. We get a lot of rejections, partly because of the neurodevelopmental delay, partly because of the ADHD symptoms. Um, if you are constantly interrupting somebody, 
um, you know, it's a little bit harder to make friends if you're constantly info dumping at them instead of like listening to them. If you don't remember their name, like there are all of these challenges that go into um, making friends that people with ADHD face. And then as adults, like uh, there's a chapter on that too, how to people where um, I talk about uh, how it's also the mindset with which we approach friendships and the na- all the negative messages, all the negative self-talk where we go in with this scarcity mindset of like, who would possibly want to be friends with me? Um, and so then when we see evidence that confirms that it, it hurts and we, and we take that on and then we keep, keep going with that mindset. And sometimes we end up in friendships that are not a good fit for us because we have this scarcity mindset of like, you know, I'll take anybody. And like, I just have to put up with what I get because who else would want to be friends with me? Right. And so there's, there's all of these, these challenges that go into it. Um, but long story short, like we end up feeling these really big feelings and then getting messages about our feelings being wrong too. So we often try to suppress them, ignore them, distract ourselves from them instead of learning what we're feeling and how to manage that and regulate it. We end up trying to suppress it. And then what happens is you can only do that for so long. And then, you know, it all kind of explodes out of us. So like it, it, as simple as example is, um, after school restraint collapse where like a kid comes home from school and has like kind of been managing, trying to manage their stuff all day and comes home and just like explodes at their mom because they can't like regulate anymore. It just all bubbles to the surface. So yeah, the, the emotion regulation piece was really surprising for me to understand as well, because it's not in the DSM. Nobody had ever explained that to me. I just thought I was too sensitive. That's what I, that's, that was a diagnosis I got from everybody around me growing up. You're just too sensitive. What was really reparative for you here? In terms of? Well, one of the things we talk about on the podcast all the time is how what happens to us when we're young really matters in different kinds of ways. And like you're saying, you know, somebody with ADHD, so many more corrections, so many more messages about them being problematic, so many more little moments in relationships where something goes a little bit sideways that might not have Mm -hmm. gone sideways for somebody else. Like that's a lot. That's a lot of water under the bridge. And You've mentioned just during what we've said so far how learning about ADHD was really helpful and kind of getting that understanding of yourself that came from that. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'm prying a little bit here, but like I, there's just such an emotional aspect to this too. And so I'm wondering what you just found really helpful in working with kind of the residues of all those experiences. I think the biggest thing was connecting with other people who had ADHD because it really normalized the experiences. It was something that we could talk about stuff openly and not be judged and not be shamed because it's like, oh yeah, like it, we would joke about it, right? Like I, I have a Discord community through Patreon, which is um, a great service where people can support the work that creators are doing. And um, and so the people in the Discord community would just like joke about how long they've left their laundry in the washer, or how many times they've had to restart it. And to us, it's just <laughs> normal and it's something that, that we can just joke about and we don't have to explain why it's hard for us or that we're not just bad people <laughs> who don't care about the environment. And that's why we don't care how many times, you know what I mean? Like there's not that same judgment. And so finding acceptance and community and, um, and having it be normalized because these struggles are normal when you have ADHD, but when you, when you have ADHD and you're living in a very neurotypical world, that's going to expect you to be neurotypical. Like sometimes people look at you like you've got two heads. Or like you must be doing this on purpose or you must not be trying hard enough or whatever it is. Um, being Even people who mean well, like there are a lot of neurotypical doctors who are like, have you tried a calendar? And we're like, no, I've never heard of that. Like, yes, of course I've tried a calendar, right? Like <laughs> that's not going to match with all of this. Um, so there's a lot of people who are well-meaning who just don't get it. And so being around people who get it and there's this kind of shared language, this shared understanding, this normalization of the struggles. That was really, really helpful. And what ended up happening was um, I was able, you know, we were able to see each other for for who we were besides the challenges. Because I think so much of it is like you face these challenges so much and you feel like you're kind of seen as the problem instead of as you've got challenges that you're that you're facing. So like you know, I'm the, I'm the bad employee. I'm the employee who's always late, or I'm the, you know, I'm the one who struggles with this and like, can't organize my paperwork. And you start to like, see yourself through the lens of like, where you're too much or not enough. And in a community with other people with ADHD, it's like, oh, we're all too much and not enough. Like, right. We're all like this. And so you start to see the other things. You start to see how like great everybody's sense of humor is or 
how energetic people are, or it's, it ends up being really interesting. Like what, what's your hyper-focus right now? Like, oh, cool. You can explain like, you know, everything about this one topic. Like that sounds cool. Like, let me learn about that. And we're able to see each other as people, not as problems. And I think that that's been really helpful for me and very healing. For the the people out there who are related to somebody with ADHD in a relationship with somebody with ADHD, is there something that you would either A, really want them to know, or B, that you think would be really helpful for them to understand? Yeah, um, go check out the book. I, I don't even care if you buy it. Like go to a Barnes and Noble, go look at chapter 12. It's called How to Heart. <laughs> go read it. Um, this chapter is specifically for the four hearts, for people who are there to learn about ADHD because they care about somebody with ADHD. And in that chapter, I try to validate the experience of the frustration that comes with like, your partner won't do yeah. what you want or need uh, them to do. It is very frustrating and very tough because it seems like they're not trying and it seems like they don't care. And like, there's all these, even me, even me who knows better at this point can still fall into that trap of like, did you not care about that? Like, I have to watch that, right? Because it it's such an easy trap to fall into. And so is parenting your partner, like, and, you know, okay, well, they're not going to remember to lock the door. So I got to make sure that I'm the one who locks the door. And I, I got to remember to, you know, to, to plan things. And I have to do this and I have to, um, I have to remind my partner about X, Y, and Z 1700 times. And it can be really easy to take on the role of partner or of parent. It can be really easy to take on the role of parent as opposed to partner, but that's not good for the relationship because that can come at the expense of the role that you already have but it is what happens by default. And we see it over and over again in these, in these, um, in these relationships of um, these patterns. Right. And so in that chapter, I talk about alternatives. I talk about how you can kind of get out of that pattern. And I also debunk a couple of things like, you know, I explain how it can look like we don't care, but here's what's actually going on under the surface. Um, And yeah, that whole chapter is just literally written for people who care about somebody with ADHD mostly from the perspective of like as a partner, but it, it same applies if you actually are a parent or if you care about somebody with ADHD in any way, um, if you're a good friend, whatever. Um, I think like the, the strategies in that are, are really important. And the, the last one is take care of yourself because it, it, that's important too. ADHD is frustrating and it's taxing on both people. And so setting your own healthy boundaries and engaging outside, outside support for yourself and allowing yourself to have feelings. It's okay you're frustrated by this behavior. We are too. (laughs) Like everybody gets to be frustrated by the fact that we can't remember to put the milk back. That's, you know, that's okay. Um, You don't have to not be frustrated with us just because, you know, we're struggling or it's a disability. That's fine. You can have feelings too. And then, and then take breaks when you need to, because it can be really easy to want to support your partner who's struggling in all of the ways that you can possibly support them. But that's not healthy for either person. One of the things you just mentioned that I thought was really interesting was that idea of parenting your partner. And I think that that's a trap that I've fallen into a couple of times where you just start getting into a pattern where where it's just really easy to be the constant reminder, to be the the, I am becoming a calendar in human form for for lack of a better (laughs) way of putting it, maybe where where that's just what we're doing now. And and I, I feel like I'm kind of embodying that mom role a little bit. Um. Are there things inside of your relationships that have like helped you step out of that comment dynamic? Yeah, I actually rewrote the ending anecdote for that chapter three times um, <laughs> because my own relationship was evolving and I, my own understanding of the best way to approach this really challenging dynamic was, was evolving too. And at first it was a lot of acceptance, right? Like accept that this is how their brain works and that, you know, they're going to struggle with these things and that's okay and like find other solutions and stuff. And then And then the second version was like, yeah, accept that. Um, accept your partner. Like, see see who they are. Understand that they're not going to be neurotypical and all those things. But also, part of that acceptance is like accepting that you may need a greater level of support. You cannot be your partner's therapist. You cannot be your partner's coach. You cannot be their, you know, accountability buddy on everything. At least, like maybe on certain things. Like, cool, we both want to work out. Let's work out together. Fine. But like, you want to work out. I will check in with you every Tuesday to see how your workouts are going. Not as great, right? So like part of the acceptance is accepting that you might need more support. Your partner might need support other than you. And then the third iteration was just like, what's the plan? It was, it was like, uh, like, 
just, you know, late, late at night and it's just, it's dark and it's in a bar and it's smoky and you're just like, okay, I'm jaded. Like I've been through the battle and like, what's the plan? Um, because I think it's like what I ended up realizing is it's unrealistic and it's naive to think that you're, that the ADHD won't impact the relationship. It will. Um, not only the ADHD, but usually ADHD comes with friends. So there's also anxiety going on or depression or autism or any number of other things, trauma, PTSD, like there's something else going on on top of the ADHD usually. So it's really unrealistic to think that that's not going to impact your relationship. And so what's the plan for dealing with it? If you make a plan together as partners, rather than one person who needs to parent the other, then you're in much better shape because now you're not parenting. That's really the difference. Like you deciding that you're in charge of reminding your partner for all of the things that they need to do, it's it's infantilizing, it's disempowering for them, it's it's frustrating and you know can cause resentment in you because you're having to do all these things that are not fun because your partner can't do them. To you go, okay, like what actually, what is important here? What are you doing? What am I doing? Like what kind of support you need? How are you gonna get that support? What role do you want me to play? If you make that plan together, now you're partners again. And so that's what my partner and I ended up realizing that we needed to do. I needed, I needed to actually take a step back from trying to do all of these things for him because I, I expressed my frustration. I was like, I'm doing like 90% of the work in this relationship and blah, blah. And he just looks at me and he goes, I didn't ask you to. And I was like, oh, he didn't. He did not ask me to. So, you know, now we try and make sure that everything's consensual. Um, it, it's a weird thing to talk about consent in terms of giving, but consent in terms of giving is really important too. If you're doing things for your partner, make sure that they want you to be doing those things. Yeah. Are you doing those things because you think that they're for the other person or are you doing them because you want them done and you think that they should be done? Like what's the motivation that's happening there? And that's that's been a huge right. thing that I've had to had to explore and work on in my own life. So that's been a major issue for me, for sure. Yeah. And that's why asking what's the plan is important, because because the other part of that conversation when he was like, well, I didn't ask you to. I was like, you're right. You didn't. At the same time, what am I supposed to do? Because this yeah. is impacting both of us. So yeah. I need there to be a plan. This isn't working for me. So like, what is the plan for this working? Because if there's not a plan that we have agreed on together, I'm going to end up trying to fix it on my own. Right. So like we need to have a plan. Like it can't just be like, well, and then that's just, we just live with it. Like that's not, you know, with certain things that wasn't going to work for me. And so we had to, we had to really collaborate and come up with a plan and, you know, it's, it's, it's give and take like any relationship. Um, but it is, I'm happy to say now, like my relationship is the happiest, healthiest relationship I have ever been in. It, it was worth the extra effort. Um, and it forced us to learn how to communicate and collaborate in a way that most, most couples, I don't think ever have to, we had to, which was hard, but now we're in a really good space because of it. That's really great to hear. And Jessica, thanks so much for doing this with me today. This has been totally fun. I've completely enjoyed it. And I just think that you're doing great work. That's helping so many people. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. This is super cool. Yeah, totally. Tell your partner I said hi. <laughs> yeah, I totally will. I totally will. She'll she'll just love this. She's gonna she's gonna die. I had a great time today talking with Jessica McCabe. She's the creator of the wonderful YouTube channel How to ADHD and author of the apparently recent New York Times bestselling book by the same name, How to ADHD: An Insider's Guide to Working with Your Brain, Not Against It. So huge congratulations to Jessica. That is a incredible accomplishment. We started today's conversation by talking about Jessica's experience with ADHD. She was diagnosed at 12, she was given a prescription, and that was kind of it. She really was not taught how to work with her mind. And one of the problems for many people who have ADHD is the, the common things that we're taught to look for are really just a very small set of all of the symptoms that can come with ADHD. It's right there in the name attention deficit and hyperactivity. But there are plenty of people with ADHD who aren't hyperactive, and by and large, the issue with ADHD is not a deficit of attention, it's actually a surplus of it, but without the ability to regulate it effectively. So you have all these people out there who have a lived experience that really does not look like the model of ADHD that we have in our minds, while still absolutely 100% being diagnosable for this condition. A while back, we talked with John Rady, who is one of the co-authors of ADHD 2.0. He's kind of a legendary guy. 
in the ADHD space, and in his book he gave a phenomenal list and description of much more holistic ADHD symptoms than people typically get, and they include things like unexplained underachievement, trouble organizing and planning, a high degree of creativity and imagination, a strong will, stubbornness, and often a refusal of help, a unique and active sense of humor, an exquisite sensitivity to criticism or rejection, an itch to change the conditions of life. And these are all things that, uh, like Jessica said during the conversation, one of the things that she thinks could be added to the diagnostic criteria, she said this a little tongue-in-cheek, but it you know, is true in her experience, is that a lot of people who have ADHD question whether or not they really should qualify for ADHD. You know, do I have ADHD or am I just lazy, I think was the example that she gave during the conversation. This is all to say that it's really understandable why somebody could get to their 30s or their 40s or their 60s and just not realize that they have ADHD. Because the model that we have of it, the uh, the image of it that gets shot out into the culture is really pretty inaccurate. We then turn to how Jessica was able to sustain motivation and the consistency that was required to write a big book. I've co-authored a book as a perfectly neurotypical person, and man, writing a book is really, really hard. And as Jessica said, it was one of the hardest things she's ever done. She talked about a couple of specific things, and she names many more in the book itself. She talked about having a accountability buddy, having somebody who she was responsible to. This was her editor who helped really keep her on track. She also talked about bringing in the support that she needed to accomplish the parts of the task that just weren't going to get done without it. And one of the things that she really kind of kept coming back to during the conversation was the importance of social support of different kinds, whether that's finding a community of people who also have ADHD so you can share and empathize and be seen in it and really just normalize your experiences. That's really helpful. If you're a fish and you're surrounded by birds all day, you're going to feel like an outsider. And you can only pretend to be a bird for so long before, man, it gets really real that you are just a fish. This is how it is. And it can be incredibly helpful to find a little school of fellow fish to swim with. That's been incredibly helpful for Elizabeth. It's clearly been really helpful for Jessica as well. One of the things that's really helpful for us to be aware of, particularly when we're trying to sustain our motivation towards some kind of a goal, is the self-talk that we use and the tone that self-talk takes. And one of the examples that Jessica gave were these two different coach voices. The first coach, uh, you're a goalie playing soccer. The other team you know, scores a goal. They win the game. Very sad. First coach just berates you for it. Says, you messed up. You should feel shitty. Do better next time. Second coach says, hey, when you're in that kind of a situation, here's what you can do in the future. And there are two important questions. First, which coach do you want to have if you want uh, the person to enjoy playing soccer more? The answer is the second coach. But which coach do you want to have if you want to become a professional soccer player? The answer is still the second coach. It both feels better and is better to be able to speak to yourself with that more constructive orientation inside. A lot of people fool themselves into thinking that if they are more self-critical, it will make them more effective. But we know that ADHD is not a behavioral issue. It's a neurological issue. This is how your brain is wired. This is the way it be. Okay, so it can't be punished out of somebody. You can speak to yourself critically until you're blue in the face. The behavior isn't going to go away because, again, it's not a behavioral issue. It's based on a neurological difference. We also talked about self-advocacy and how Jessica was able to get to a place where she could claim her authentic needs as somebody with ADHD and get more comfortable expressing those needs to other people. And that then took us into a conversation about relationships. And there's a great chapter on relationships in the book. And there was a part of it that was really helpful for me as somebody who is in a relationship with somebody who has ADHD. And that's the very basic notion that empathy goes both ways here. As the uh, more neurotypical member of the partnership, I need to have a lot of empathy for Elizabeth's experience. I need to get that her experience is real. I need to take it seriously. I need to really get that she's not acting in a way that frustrates me because she's trying to frustrate me. This is just how her brain works, and there is a huge place for empathy and understanding there. And there's also a huge place for honoring my own needs and uh, what I want out of a relationship. And I thought it was really great how Jessica closed by talking about, hey, what's our plan here? 
What are our agreements? What are we committing to? How are we going to deal with these kinds of issues in the future? Just getting really granular about what we're actually all signing up for here in a way that extends empathy in both directions so both people can feel uh, seen and heard by the situation. I really enjoyed talking with Jessica today. I've been a big fan of her work for a long time. I would really recommend checking out her channel if you have ADHD or know somebody who does. It's How to ADHD on YouTube. Take a look at her book. I think that you'll really enjoy it. And hey, if you'd like to support our podcast, you can subscribe wherever you're listening to it now on. You can tell a friend about it. You can leave a rating and a positive review on iTunes. That really helps us out. And hey, if you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find me on Substack. And you can find the podcast on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for just a few dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll get a bunch of bonuses in return. Until next time, thanks for listening and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>